Thank you very much. It's my privilege to be here with you tonight and uh, just to share a little bit about my own experience having uh, recently traveled to Port-au-Prince and spent some time there helping out after the, uh, the earthquake. Uh, in addition to serving here at Biola for the last 26 years, teaching in the Christian Education Department and now recently serving as the Vice Provost, I have also been uh, trained in uh, both urban and wilderness search and rescue as a, a member of the Orange County Search and Rescue Team and I'm also a chaplain for the Irvine Police Department. So over the years, I've had an opportunity to be able to sort of lend a hand where, where hands are needed. Uh, very soon after the devastating attack in New York, I had the opportunity to be able to travel to Ground Zero and spend some time there. I did my first 12-hour uh, shift in the morgue as they were bringing the body parts in at the pit. And I spent a week counseling the individuals who were coming through traumatized by what they were seeing through the search and rescue efforts now, I thought I'd seen an awful lot. I mean, it was pretty devastating to see seven buildings in, a, in about a two-square-block region of, of lower Manhattan absolutely leveled and wiped out. And now, uh, that was pretty overwhelming to see. And then a number of years later, as I traveled to uh, New Orleans to help out after Katrina, and uh, there to spend some time, again, doing some counseling, helping out the officers, I got into New Orleans before everyone else was allowed back in because of, I carried my police credentials. And I did uh, a fair amount of counseling with the officers. And, and now I, I was uh, somewhat prepared for what I was going to see because I'd spent some time in New York, but I was not prepared for the magnitude of what I saw there in New Orleans where entire city blocks, entire neighborhoods were wiped out, touring the, the Lower Ninth Ward and see neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood utterly devastated by the effects of that hurricane, that was, that was a lot. But then to travel to Port-au-Prince and to spend some time driving through that city, now that was a magnitude that I was not prepared for. I stayed at a school in, right in the heart of Port-au-Prince and I drove for an hour and a half each day to the outskirts of town and every third or fourth building, whether it was a house or a school or a mall, or a store, or whatever it might be, every third or fourth building was leveled. And in many of these buildings, there were bodies still inside. You could smell them as you drove through the streets. In one particular case, I drove uh, up to sort of the crest of a hill. I came across uh, what was told to me through my Haitian interpreter, uh, GOC, which is the Engineering Institute. It was, it was a university. There were 300 students in a six-story building going through classes that Friday afternoon when the earthquake struck and all six stories came down, one on top of the other, all 300 students killed instantly, faculty included, bodies still in the rubble. There's no equipment available to be able to extricate the bodies. So as you drive through town, you know that many of the bodies are still in there. Every third or fourth building Sometimes entire shopping malls leveled, schools, hospitals, houses, still leveled today. They lack the kind of equipment that is needed, the kind of equipment that we had at Ground Zero. They don't have that kind of equipment there today. So as a result, there are people there now with, with sledgehammers about this big, beating on thick, two-foot thick slabs of concrete trying to extricate the bodies out. Talk about an exercise in futility. But it's all they've got. They've got nothing else. And although there are many people, tens of thousands there to provide some sort of relief effort, the needs are so overwhelming. I've been to Port-au-Prince on a number of occasions. I've been to uh, Dominican Republic uh, dozens of times, leading uh, short-term mission trips with Biola students over the years. So I knew somewhat what I was going to be looking at when I got there in terms of Port-au-Prince, but I wasn't prepared for the magnitude of what I was going to see. In some cases, the body is still visible as you drove down the streets. And there today, the needs are still so great. I traveled with a team of 20 medical doctors. My job was to set up a mobile clinic each day so that the doctors could go in, and usually within an hour, we'd have anywhere from two to 500 people because as soon as they heard in the neighborhoods that there were free doctors available to, to treat them, they came from everywhere. So anywhere from two to 500 people, the doctors would see each day. 
We'd set up the clinic, a pharmacy, and various waiting rooms. We'd treat people all day long, and then about 5 o'clock, we'd pack it all up, drive back to where we were staying, and the next day, do it all over again. So each day, we saw hundreds of people, many of whom were, were walking wounded from the two weeks earlier when the earthquake struck. Many of those wounds were not being properly treated, and so as a result, infection had set in. So the doctors did what they could to provide antibiotics and bandages and to help them on their way. But what's really uh, perhaps the greatest tragedy of all is what's just around the corner. Because on April the 1st, in just two days, begins the beginning of rainy season. And when rainy season strikes, with that rain will come the mosquitoes. And the mosquitoes will simply just move in and do their thing. The majority of the population, of the two million people in Port-au-Prince today, are not sleeping in houses. They don't trust the buildings. Why would they when their neighbor's house has been flattened? So even though their home may still be standing, they're not living in it. The majority of the population of Port-au-Prince tonight, even as I speak on this platform, is sleeping under sheets, under makeshift shanty homes and towns, just under tarps. And pretty soon when the rains strike and the mosquitoes move in, malaria and dengue fever will not be far behind. Many of these 200,000 people who were quickly buried in shallow graves, as the water table rises from these rains, you can well imagine what's going to happen as these rains and the water work its way into the creeks and the streams where people bathe, where people draw water for cooking. Disease will be rampant. Cholera will be widespread. It's estimated that the majority of the people that will die will, will die from the diseases. Far more surpass what died from the earthquake. So the, the worst, perhaps, is yet to come. They need our efforts. Now, I'm not a medical doctor, so there's a limitation to what I could provide, but I could do something. I could start a generator, I could build a mobile clinic, I could carry supplies for the doctors to help them do what they were able to do. Tonight is a beautiful picture of the body of Christ. I can come and share what I've seen. I can't sing, I certainly can't dance, I can't play a musical instrument, but each of us can do something. And some of us here tonight can pray. Some of us can give. And together, all of us can make a difference. Let me conclude with just one story of a little boy that uh, we were doing a triage out on the street, right in front of the, the palace. I'm sure you've all seen palace, uh, the pictures of the presidential palace that have been devastated. We're, we're right on the street. We're under some makeshift tarps, and I'm sitting with some medical doctors as people were coming in with different ailments. And we're doing triage to determine what doctor would see what patient. And this little boy came in about nine years of age named Peterson, cutest little boy, complaining of a stomach ache. So as we began to ask him questions, we determined, well, he's got a stomachache because he hasn't eaten in days. So I said, listen, I'll, I'll get you some food. Come with me. But before we go, uh, where's your mom and dad? And so they know where I'm taking you. And he says, I don't have a mother and father. They were both killed in our house in the earthquake 12 days ago. My brother and I were out playing in the street. When the earthquake struck and the roof came down, my mom and dad were killed. I said, well, then where's your little brother? He has an eight-year-old brother. And he says, well, I, I was taking care of him, but about three days ago in this large sort of refugee camp, I turned the corner, and you know how little brothers are? He sort of wandered off, and I haven't seen him in three days. I have no idea where he is. He's just literally living on the streets, trying to find a place to sleep at night, trying to find food, as I've been trying to do. I said, do you not have any grandparents, any aunts or uncles, anyone at all? Maybe someone in the country, I can, I can arrange transportation to get you there. And he says, I've got no one. So I got him something to eat, and then I took him over to the clinic, and I gave him a job sorting bandages just to kind of keep an eye on him for the rest of the day. And about 5 o'clock, when we had to sort of say goodbye, as he was walking out, one of the ladies came in and, and began to talk with him. And so I I got a hold of the lady, and through a Crayola interpreter, I said, do you know this little boy? And she goes, yeah, I, I live in the neighborhood that he was from. And, and so through our Crayola interpreter, we discovered that his story was true, that his parents were killed. He has no living relative. And so I said, can you take him with you for a couple of days? And she goes, I don't have a husband. I've got four kids, and I'm living under a queen-sized a queen sheet. So I don't really have room for any more. So I gave her a little money and said, maybe just for a couple of days. And she goes, okay, just a couple of days. 
So I prayed, I said, God, I need a miracle. I need a home for a homeless child. Lord, I know that you care about this little boy far more than I do, but I care about him so much I could weep. So I said, God, please help me to find a home for this boy. So I emailed a friend of mine who was staying at a, at a place, a school way up in northern Haiti, and I said, Connie, do you know anyone that has an orphanage? I know the orphanages are swollen full, but do you know anyone that has room for another little boy? And if you do, can you please call me on my cell phone, as if maybe the cell phone would even reach me. The next day, she called on my cell phone and said, yeah, Michael, I've got someone up here that's got room for one more little boy. I said, just book the room. I said, I'll find a way to get him there. And so I contacted this little boy at the place where he was staying, and I, I was able to make arrangements for him to be able to get transported up to that orphanage. And about three or four days after I returned back to Biola, I got an email and a photograph of a little boy that's now living in an orphanage with a, with a Christian couple where he's got food and shelter and an education. He's riding a bicycle for the very first time. This lady who's the orphanage director says it, it had to be dark by the time he got off the bike. He'd never ridden a bike before. He had so much fun. He's got a smile on his face. I said, God, thank you. Thank you for the, for the miracle that you did in this little boy's life. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the story of the, the individual walking down the beach and finding the sand dollars, and tens of thousands of sand dollars, and yet one gets picked up and thrown back. And someone says, was it, was it worth it? I mean, you can't save them all. It was, it was worth it for that one. And so for me to go to Haiti for a couple of weeks, absence from my family and from Biola, it was worth it for Peterson Jack Joseph, who today is living in a home where he's cared for. It makes all the difference in the world. Your resources, your gifts tonight will make a difference in someone's life. I guarantee it. The needs are great seemingly endless, but for the grace of God, it would be our condition. And so we have a responsibility to give back, to do something in the name of Jesus, whether it's to sing, to play an instrument, to dance, to give, to pray. As the body of Christ, we could all do something. And so we're called to reach out to be the hands and feet of Jesus. The mission of Biola University Biblically centered education, scholarship and service, equipping men and women to impact the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we're doing tonight. We have an opportunity to impact a piece of the world in the name of Jesus. So thank you for coming. Thank you for giving. Thank you for sharing of what God has given to you. And may your gift be multiplied to reach out in the name of Jesus to a nation who needs the message of hope that only Christ can bring. God bless you. Thank you.